Hello class, and welcome to another session by Professor Choi. Uh, today we're going to be talking about a really cool model, something called the Aggregate Expenditure Model. And the Aggregate Expenditure Model is really the model that um, is the foundation for a lot of the fiscal and monetary policy that we use today um, in order to fix the economy when it goes into a recession. As a matter of fact, uh, these models, some people refer to as recession economics. So um, let's get started. Now, the aggregate expenditure model was developed by, this, uh, by John Maynard Keynes, or Keynes, in the 1930s. And he did it in a publication called The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money. Um, after he created this, uh, there was a sort of new branch of economics um, and that was created at the time. And today, most economists, when you ask them, they, um, they definitely feel that they're part of this sort of branch of economics. Um, this branch of economics is called Keynesian economics. Uh, some people refer to it as recession economics. And a lot of neoclassical economists are in, in a big part Keynesian. Um, now, the particular model that we're going to uh, learn today is outdated um, because it has, makes a couple of assumptions that are no longer true. So a model like the aggregate supply, aggregate demand model is a better explanation of how economic activity works. But this model, again, in many ways, is the foundation for a lot of the thing, a lot of the um, policy, fiscal and monetary policy that we use today to fix economic activity when something is happening. So anyway, um, before we get into John Maynard Keynes, we need to kind of talk a little bit about history. So if you go back to 1776, this is sort of when economics started. Um, the first, or what we call the father of modern economics, is Adam Smith, and he was a philosopher in 1776, and he was the first, um, the first economist. So he's considered basically to be the father of modern economics. Now, he created a sort of branch of economics, which today we sort of call classical. Now, this branch of economics was a lot about uh, free the market. So it was about free markets. And a lot of it was also cyclical in nature. So in this um, branch of economics, most things uh, were better if they were free with very little government intervention and with very little intervention from the outside. So he was actually one of the stronger proponents of just allowing markets to be free. Now, at the time, in 1776, this was a fairly easy argument because most places were being run by kings and queens and guilds um, and um, lords or things of that sort, and they had very heavy control over things. So his arguments basically were, that we need to let the market be, and the market by itself will figure out the things that people need. And he did this by studying. So he went around um, and he wrote this book called The Wealth of Nations for short, or An Inquiry into the Wealth of Nations. And in this particular publication, what he basically did is he went around uh, Europe and he studied that countries that were freer were basically wealthier. Not only was the population wealthier, but also the kings and the queens in those places. So he made an extremely strong argument that the markets should be free. And again, this is what we call classical economics. Um, from a lot of this came uh, things like the model of supply and demand, 
and a lot of the explanations that we had for economic activity. And this was basically economics from 1776 all the way to about the 1930s. So basically, if you, have been, if you would have been around in the Great Depression of 1929, which started in 1929, and you would have spoken to an economist at the time, they would have told you that um, you don't need to do anything to fix the recession. You basically just have to wait it out because the recessions come and go, they're cyclical, and they happen because of this relationship between um, interest and labor and unemployment and income and so on. So basically, it wasn't um, it wasn't something that we could control. It was sort of something sort of natural. Um, in the 1930s, therefore, when we went through the depression, if you ask an economist, what are you supposed to do? The answer was nothing. So don't do anything. And that's basically what we did. You know, 1929, did nothing. 1930, didn't do much. 1931, didn't do much at all. 1932, didn't do much at all. It really wasn't until about 1933 or so with something called the New Deal. And you can kind of search about this, by the way, if you're interested. So it wasn't until the New Deal that we started seeing um, a sort of more active government. So the New Deal was the sort of first legislation to combat the recession. And a lot of this legislation basically was written because of this new uh, sort of Keynesian way of looking at things that was being developed at the time. All right. So this is where the aggregate expenditure model basically comes in. Now, the aggregate expenditure model, in many ways, is in uh, sort of the entire almost of this. So the model basically says that, no, uh, economic activity doesn't really come in cycles, that they have to do with expenditures. So the key to economic activity is expenditures. And income and the relationship between those. All right, um, and and this was really the key to a lot of the things. So it was sort of um, what he used to call an upward cycle being created by these autonomous expenditures. All right. So let's kind of get started with the aggregate expenditure model. Now, the aggregate expenditure model was the way in which um, Joe Maynard Keynes explained this relationship. And the aggregate expenditure model basically looks like this. So on this side, he put output. We like to use a letter Y for that. On this side, he put aggregate expenditures. And he had a line here. Now this line is a 45 degree line. And what that basically means is that there's a relationship on this line of one to one of output and expenditures. So he sort of considered this line equilibrium. Then we have another line which for him was the way the economy really behaved. So this line is basically how output in the economy functions. And one of the things that he did on the book is he started breaking down the sections in the economy. So he said that the economy was 
the consumption sector plus the investment sector plus the government sector plus the net export sector. He also said that this point here where the economy starts is some kind of autonomous expenditure level and then he said that then the economy will kind of follow this function now the slope of this function is given by something called the marginal propensity to consume or MPC which we will explain later so it's called the marginal propensity to consume All right? and the marginal propensity to consume will basically uh, give us the slope to the function for the economy all right, now we would find equilibrium in this particular model right here. So this will be equilibrium output. Let's call this y1. And this will be equilibrium aggregate expenditures in the economy. All right. By the way, some professors like to use aggregate income over here. It's very similar because according to John Maynard Keynes, all this stuff is very much related. All right, now to understand the um, why did he use this 45 degree line and what exactly is the relationship between output and expenditures, let's, uh, let's look at a very simple relationship. So let's say that on, I, I make this very simple um, three-step table. So over here, we're going to have our aggregate expenditures. Over here, we're going to have our income level and over here on the last one I guess I need more space let's put our output level now to understand this relationship between output income and expenditures let's oversimplify the economy so let's say that the income level or the output, the money that we have in the economy right now is $1 and the price of everything is $1. And again, we're, I'm trying to oversimplify things so I can explain the relationship between expenditures, income, and output in a very simple way. All right. So imagine that Professor Choi is the one holding that $1. And I wake up to, today with that $1 and I say, okay, well, I'm going to spend it, okay? So I go eat something because I'm hungry and I want to go eat some breakfast. So now I go to this restaurant and I spend my $1. All right, now let's take a look at how that works in, in the economy. So this transaction of buying breakfast is an expenditure for Professor Choi because he was the one that spent it, equal to $1. It's income for the individual who received it, in this case, the restaurant. And it is also a dollar in output in economic activity. And the output that we produce for this $1 is $1 worth of food. So basically, my $1 just created aggregate expenditures because Professor Choi spent it. But somebody received this, so it created income for that person. And it created output in the economy equal to $1. All right, now let's say that that person wakes up the morning right after that and says, okay, well, I got to spend it. Oh, look at that. I have a flat tire. So they show up and they have to go to a mechanic shop and they got to fix that flat tire. Again, for simplicity purpose, assume that everything, like I said, the price of everything is $1. So when they go and they spend the money on the mechanic shop equal to $1, it was expenditure for that person because they paid it. But it's income for the individual who received it. And it was a dollar of mechanical services that we just created in the economy. 
All right. Now let's say that the day after that, that mechanic that fixed the car has to drop their children in daycare. So now that mechanic wakes up in the morning and transfers that one dollar. It is an expenditure for him, but it is income for the daycare, and we just created one dollar in daycare services. All right, now I think at this point you're getting the idea. Now imagine that I stop you right now, and I would ask you, well, what is the amount of output in this economy? How much did we produce? Well, we'll produce $1 on day one, $1 on day two, and $1 on day three. So the total level of output in the economy is $3. But look, the only amount of money we had in the economy is $1. All we've been doing is basically passing around the same dollar. So how do we create three output with only $1 in money? And welcome to one of the biggest things that he was explaining, John Maynard Keynes, that output comes from the movement of money, not from having the money. In other words, the flow of money is what generates output. The expenditures of that money is what generates output. It's not the money itself that generates output. In other words, you could have all the money in the world sitting on a pile, but if it doesn't move, then output is not generated. So therefore, output has to do with expenditures, with the flow. The flow is what generates output. All right, notice that there's a one-one relationship here, and that's what that 45 degree line is. Now, he also basically explained that people don't spend all of their money. Some of the money is being saved. So let's say that this individual one decided not to spend the whole dollar, only 90 cents. Then what will be moved to the next person is 90 cents. Now, let's say that that person also decided to save 10 cents. Then what will be moved to the next person will be 80 cents and so on. So the economy is not the 45 degree line. It's more like an offline, depending on how much people want to save and how much people want to consume. So John Maynard Keynes talked about the margin of propensity to consume and the margin of propensity to save have to be equal to one. So whatever amount of money we don't consume, we save. So if I have, say, um, a hundred dollars and I consume 90 of those dollars then my savings is 10 and therefore if this is the way I allocate my income so every time I receive a hundred dollars I consume 90 and I save 10 then my margin of propensity to consume will be equal to 0.9 and then my margin of propensity to save will be equal to 0.1. Okay, so margin of propensity to consume and margin of propensity to save equals 1. All right, now he also took a very long time. And by the way, today I'm going to oversimplify the model. But basically, he took a really long time explaining each of these components and how he thought at the time they change the level of output. So each one of these becomes a sort of extra function on top of this basic function for the economy. So um, to give you a sort of more complete function, and again, depends on how deep you want to go into this, but basically he said that the level of output or economic activity has to do with consumption, plus investment, plus government spending, plus net exports. But then he said that consumption is equal to the level of autonomous expenditures plus the margin of propensity to consume times the level of income minus taxation, which we call today disposable income. Then he talked about the level of investments and he said that investment is a function of income 
and interest rates. And then economists like to kind of talk about this investment as a sort of investment function where we have investment over here, we have interest rates over here, and it's sort of this downward sloping negative function. Then he talked about the government and what the government is supposed to do, and he said that basically Congress can do whatever they want, so something we can't really foresee. And then um, he talked about net exports, and he talked about the different things that can change the way foreigners see us or the way foreigners spend money um, in the U.S. So things like appreciation and depreciation of the currency, so basically um, the dollar value versus another currency. And then he talked about um, GDP growth of you versus them. And then he talked about um, inflation and inflation expectations. All right, so anyway, I'm not gonna go too complex into this particular model. Instead, I'm just gonna give you the basics for it. So let's go back to the model and let's talk about 45 degree line. This right here is our economy, which is basically output equals C plus I plus G plus net exports. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about how John Maynard King saw what happened in the Great Depression of 1929. All right, so we had a really bad stock market crash um, in 1929. Again, if you wanna if you wanna read about it, basically September 4th, 1929, uh, stock market took a severe crash in the United States, and this was after the Roaring Twenties. So the Twenties were absolutely fantastic for the United States, which then culminated into this fantastic crash of um, 1929 in September 4th, 1929. Now he sort of uh, think about this event, and he said, well. What basically happened was, or again, this is sort of my interpretation of how he saw it. So he's like, look, somebody basically decided, woke up the next morning right after the crash and said, I am not going to be spending as much money as before. So there was a decline in autonomous consumption and maybe even in autonomous investment. And somebody said, I don't have as much money as I did before. So I'm going to have to cut back on all those factories and all that production and all that stuff that I wanted to do. Now, as a consequence of that, there was a sort of reset in the economy. So the, the level of autonomous expenditures declined. And there was a sort of change in the economy from say this line one 
to this line 2. Now, how would you notice this change? Well, you would notice a change because there was a decline in expenditures on the day after the crash, or the month after the crash, or after the crash, basically. So there was a measurable decline in the level of expenditures. So expenditures decline. All right. So how does that translate into a recession? Well, if expenditures decline, then those people did not spend money. As a consequence of that, the individual who's receiving all of that income level will receive less income. Because those businesses are now receiving less income, they would have to lay off workers. Because of this decline in income and this layoff of workers, the level of output in the economy will have to decline by an equal amount to that. So we go from an initial decline in expenditures to then a decrease in the level of output. So we go from this point, call it 1, to this point, call it 2, and then to this point, call it Three. All right, but the day right after that, all of those people that were laid off don't have this income. And because they don't have this income, they cannot spend money on what they used to spend money. As a consequence of that, aggregate expenditure decreases again. Because of that decline in aggregate expenditures, we have a decrease in the level of income. That decrease in the level of income creates another decrease in the level of output which then generates a decrease and another layoff. All right, now this relationship, which again was part of the name for his book, it's called The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, is when he started explaining that a decline in autonomous expenditures at the beginning, it's a sort of a beginning of a ripple of what a lot of people like to call a downward spiral. So the economy goes into this sort of downward spiral generated by this initial decrease in the level of expenditures. And the decrease in the level of expenditures is something that we can kind of measure by looking at the function of the economy changing position. But then what you're going to see visually out there is a decrease in expenditures followed by a decrease in output then follow by another decrease in expenditures, then follow by another decrease in output, and then another decrease in expenditures and another decrease in output, and then you end up in this new point. Let's call it Y2. Now, this is kind of like where you were, say, in 1929, and this is sort of like where you are after the whole cycle has kind of run itself here. And you're now sitting in 1933. And you have a pretty bad recession. Unemployment is 25%. By some books, it was even 40%. And now the economy is suffering pretty bad. All right. So how do you get out of this recession, according to John Maynard Keynes? Well, that's what he sort of explained, how economic activity decreases, but then how can you increase economic activity? All right, so if you look at these functions here, okay, a decrease in the level of consumption and a decrease in the level of autonomous investment can come from a decline in this or a decline in the level of income for by investors. All right, but notice that we have more things that you can change. Notice also that Y is here, we also have MPC, and the government is also part of the economy. So one of the things that he was explaining at the time is that what we really need to be doing is we need to be putting the government to work. So basically, money, because everybody's kind of saving it and putting it away instead of using it, what they're going to be doing is there's going to be a pile of money sitting out there somewhere, usually at the bank. And it is the job of the government to figure out a way 
to move it around. Because remember, at the end of the day, economic activity is created by the flow of money, not by money itself. So what the government's job is, is to take that money that's being sitting on a pile and then use it and move it around. Now, in a very basic way, what the government needs to do is they need to borrow and spend. All right. Now, what's that going to do? Well, in a very basic way, it's going to make the G create a push in the opposite direction. So it kind of sort of puts a backstop on the sliding of economic activity. And it makes the function sort of jump in the opposite direction. All right? And welcome to what we call today a stimulus plan. Or a bailout, government bailout. All right, the, uh, some of the latest of stimulus plans, um, in the year 2008, we passed something called TARP, and TARP was the bailout of the banking system. It was called the Trouble Asset Relief Program, and it was passed somewhere around the year of, uh, 2008 by President George W. Bush. Now, right after that, we passed the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. And the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act was basically the people's stimulus plan. And this was passed in February of 2009. So this is some of the latest iterations of what I just explained. Now, if you're living in the year 2020, the CARES Act all right, is sort of the latest iteration of something like this. All right. So if you want to read again uh, a lot more about this, this is basically the stimulus that was passed in Congress in March of 2020 to, um, to kind of alleviate the negative side effects of the shutdown of COVID-19 in the economy. And there probably would be more than that. So this is just sort of the beginning. All right. Again, one of the things that the CARES Act um, created is this direct payment to Americans of uh, somewhere around, I think it's $1,200 uh, to most taxpayers and $600 per, $500 per child. So um, what we're basically saying or what the government basically did right now is they injected direct money into the income portion of the consumption sector in the economy. And they injected money right into income, which, assuming people use it, should generate an increase in consumption. Therefore, kind of offsetting that decline of economic activity. All right? And this is the basics for a stimulus plan. Now, if a stimulus plan is successful, then what it will do is it will create the same relationship that I just explained here but in the sort of opposite direction, therefore creating this upward spiral of economic activity. All right? And that's the basics of the aggregate expenditure model. Now, in the subsequent slides, by the way, what I basically tried to do is I just break down a lot of this stuff. So I explained something that uh, he found, something called the multiplier effect. Now, the multiplier effect is a process by which an increase in autonomous expenditures leads to a larger change in GDP. Now, the multiplier effect 
is what you see right here. So let me create um, a different graph so we can see the multiplier effect a little better. So this is a 45 degree line and this is the, oh, that was wrong. All right, and this is the economy. Now, when I shift economic activity upwards, and I move this line here, all right, we like to move it parallel to the previous line. Now, notice that the amount that aggregate expenditure increase is this right here. But notice that the change in economic activity is from equilibrium one to equilibrium two, which is this right here. So basically what Joe Maynard Keynes was explaining is that a portion of the push in economic activity will come from the direct money that you're spending in the economy, but there's going to be an extra push being generated by the behavior that people have of expending or spending even more money and so on, or borrowing money and so on. So this is what he called the multiplier. So the change in gross domestic product, the change in output, is going to be equal to the changes in autonomous expenditures times the multiplier which he, uh, which was uh, we, the simple expenditures multiplier, we like to call it that, is one over one minus MPC, or what is the same, one over MPS. All right, this is what we call the expenditures multiplier, or at least the theoretical expenditures multiplier. All right, so economic activity, the changing output. It's not only the initial change in autonomous expenditures, but also it's the multiplier effect. So the economy, let's say, the decline by this much, then what he was explaining is that it's going to grow by that much and then some, depending on the size of the stimulus. So the stimulus generates like a kick. I want you to think about this being like, I don't know, somebody playing soccer, okay? So you hit the ball, and then the ball is just going to keep bouncing. And it's going farther than when you kicked it. So the government generates the initial kick, but then the ball will continue to bounce through the multiplier effect. So the economy will continue to grow, but the government has to provide the initial kick in order for that to happen. And that's really the basis of a lot of stimulus plans. All right. So again, on all these chapters, I basically just give, break, do give you the breakdown for uh, how exactly, what exactly is margin of propensity to consume, what is margin of propensity to save, and sort of like how to find the multiplier effect. All right. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about um, the um, the multiplier effect fairly quickly. So let's come up with an example. All right, now let's say that we want to figure out what the change in GDP is gonna be for a certain amount of autonomous expenditures. So let's say there's an increase in government spending of, um, let's call it 1,000 and we have a margin of propensity to consume of say 0 0.9. Now what that basically means by the way is that if you receive a thousand dollars, I want you to think about you know the government gives you a thousand, then how much of those one thousand you're gonna spend, how much you're gonna save. So the idea is that if you receive a thousand, then you're gonna go ahead and consume 0.9 of that or 0.9 
times a thousand, which will be 900. And then you're going to go ahead and save 0 0.1 times a thousand of that for 100. Now this consumption that you decided to do will then generate a multiplier because that consumption is somebody else's income. So that other individual is going to now receive the 900 and then they're going to spend a piece and they're going to save a piece. And then that consumption that generated by that other individual then generates another consumption and saving cycle. And then that consumption creates another consumption and saving cycle. Welcome to the multiplier. Right? So therefore, the total change in GDP is going to be equal to the initial 1,000 times 1 over 1 minus the margin of propensity to consume. So it's going to be 1,000 times 1 over 1 minus 0 0.9. So this becomes 1,000 times 1 over 0 0.1. So it becomes 1,000 times 10, or 10,000. So in a very basic way, we go back to the way I was kind of explaining it here, the government generates the initial 1,000, but then the output, the total output generated in economic activity is going to be equal to 10,000. Now, that doesn't happen in one year. It's going to happen when it happens. You know? So it, it depends really on how quickly people spend their money. So it depends on this like, consumption. And it also depends on the margin of propensity to consume. All right? How steep this line basically is. But the point is, is that a change in government spending in the upward direction generates a sort of kick that creates this upward cycle in the economy, therefore getting you out of that recessionary environment that you're in. And welcome to the first stimulus plan in the 1930s. Now, the second portion of my PowerPoint here is explaining to you what are the sectors in the economy that generate that change and in which direction. All right. So changes in consumption. Um, you, if you have a decrease in your taxes, for example, that increases your disposable income, which then increases your level of consumption. If you have an increase in your wealth, there's an increase in consumption because of that. If you expect future income to increase, then you expect uh, you normally see consumption increase. If you see an increase in inflation that lowers household wealth, therefore it decreases consumption. If you see an increase in the level of interest rates, that normally creates more savers than borrowers, therefore it decreases consumption. So what I did in the next few chapters here is I kind of gave you an idea for what are the things that change consumption and in which direction, what are the things that change investment and in which direction, what are the things that change government spending and in which direction, and what are the things that affect net exports. Okay, so uh, this is again the, this is sort of the, the rest of the stuff that you want to study if you want to also understand how to make economic activity increase or decrease. Um, to give you an idea of what another country may do, so let's say that you are a, a, a country and you depend quite heavily on exports. One of the things that you could do is you could depreciate your currency. So you could artificially depreciate your currency to generate an increase in the level of exports. All right? And this is explained right here. All right. So anyhow, um, I hope this chapter provided a sort of basics for how the aggregate expenditure model works and for what are the determinants of economic activity. Now, notice again that the list that I provide down here, every time I say increase, we're talking about a shift in the line upwards. And every time I say a decrease, we're talking about a shift in the line downwards. Okay? So 
Have a good one. Um, this was another lesson by Professor Choi.